good to have you back. How many of you have ever gone on a first date? Those are nerve-wracking times, right? I am so glad that I am done with the first dates of my life. Is there an amen in the house, honey? Uh, I, uh, I read a story about a, a young teenage uh, boy who was going on his first date, and he went to the candy store to prepare. And he went up to the owner of the, the candy store, and he said, I need three boxes of candy. One of them, uh, give me one pound of candy. The second one, put two pounds of candy. And the third one, put five pounds of candy in it. And the candy store owner was curious, and he asked why. And the boy explained that he had a date with a very pretty girl, his very first date with her. And uh, he said, now, after dinner, we're going to go out to the porch. And if she lets me hold her hand, I'm going to give her the one-pound box of candy. He said, now, uh, if, he le- if she lets me put my arm around her shoulders, I'm going to give her the two-pound box of candy. And he said, well, what are you going to do if you, with the five-pound? Well, if she lets me kiss her, Then I'm going to give her the five-pound box of candy. And he said, all right. So he put it all together, and he paid. The the boy paid for it. That night, he knocked on the front door, and he came in, and he was to meet the family, and he sat down, and and they were going to have a nice meal before he went out to the the porch with his young lady. And the father said, would you you pray uh, for the meal? And he said, I'd be glad to, and he began to pray. Jesus, help all the missionaries in Africa and in South America and in Europe and United States and help all the churches. And he began to list all the churches in town, the Methodist Church and the Baptist Church and uh, the Assemblies Church. And he prayed and he prayed for grandma and his great aunt who had the, 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 the corn on her foot and oh, on and on. And finally, everybody got nervous and and when he finally said, amen, the, the young lady uh, leaned over and, and said, I didn't r- realize you were so religious. And he whispered back, I didn't realize your dad owned the candy store. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always best to know your adversary isn't it? But can I tell you, it's so much more important to know who's watching over you, who's protecting you. Over the last two weeks, we have studied the names of God, and I hope you got one of these uh, with your, your bulletin. It, I'm not going to be preaching through all of those names, though. I would absolutely love to, but on the back of that are some scriptures and what each one of those mean. Can I just invite you this becomes a really good uh, outline for prayer. Just begin to say, God, I know your name is Jehovah uh, Mekadesh, the Lord who sanctifies me. I know you are Jehovah Rohi. The Lord is my shepherd, and God will use that as a, as a reminder to help you know how to pray. So uh, that's a, it's a great tool for you. Two weeks ago, I talked about how God steps out on the creation uh, platform and introduces himself in Genesis chapter 1, and he said, I am Elohim. I am your creator, right? And then last week, we talked about Abraham taking Isaac to the Mount, uh, Mount Moriah, which is today where the, the Temple Mount is, and, and uh, God introduced himself as Jehovah Jaira, the Lord will provide, right? I'm looking forward to introducing you to the next name, but I'm going to invite you to stand in honor of reading God's word, and I'm going to be reading Exodus chapter 17, starting with verse 8. Hear the word of the Lord. The, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Raphidim. 
Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to find, uh, fight the Amalekites tomorrow. I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and, and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites' army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under the heavens. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you. During the battle, during a battle in the Civil War, Gen uh, General Thomas Jonathan Jackson was leading his troops from Virginia, uh, which of course fought for the Confeder Confederacy, and one man from, the, uh, from another division saw General Jackson on a horse leading his troops, standing in the stirrups, screaming and hollering, leading his men as they shot towards him, and this man that saw him pronounced, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. Rally behind the Virginians. And they did so. And in that battle, the Confederacy won, and it was a surprising victory during that awful war. And so Th General Thomas, or, uh, Thomas Jonathan Jackson was from then on named Stonewall Jackson. That's what most of us know him by. So that day, he became the banner. He became the, the, the one that people saw uh, that led the Confederate troops, especially on that day, to victory. So while bullets were flying all over, they saw Jackson ahead of them, uh, riding his horse, standing on his stirrups. He was this, this impregnable stone wall that, that, that everyone would, uh, would or should rally behind. And so his new name, Stonewall Jackson, stood for this, this, this cause, this someone who is worthy to follow. Well, it's interesting in this story, God introduces a new name. It's Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord is our banner. And throughout the Old Testament, God is continually introducing himself, especially to his people, the Israelites. He wants them to understand who he is. He wants them to understand what his characteristics are, how he can help them, how he will respond, how they were to respond to him, and what he expects from them. The Israelites were fighting for their lives. They had just escaped Egypt. They were fighting their way through the wilderness. God had promised that they would be receiving the promised land, and they hadn't arrived yet. They were still searching for that. And on this day, they come upon their very first battle outside of the Egyptians the Amalekites. And Moses, the leader, sends Joshua to enjoin the battle that is to happen below them down in the valley. And Moses was leading and his lieutenants were with him, Aaron and Hur. They would stand beside him and make sure that he had everything that he needed to lead. And so as Moses 
stood on the hillside, they realized that when his, his arms were lifted high in prayer, they would win down below. But as his arms begin to droop in, in exhaustion, they would begin to lose. And so Joshua and Aaron and, and Hur stood beside him, beside Moses, and they held his hands high all day long to ensure that victory would be theirs. Here's some lessons. The first is this, problems often come when we are at rest spiritually. The Israelites had a very physical and spiritually exhausting last month. During the last 30 days, they had watched seven plagues attack Egypt. And even though they did not feel the effects of that, they were watching their friends or their neighbor deal with that. That was spiritually exhausting. They had escaped Egypt. They hadn't just escaped, but they were able to gather treasures from Egypt and bring them out. They were then chased out of Egypt by uh, soldiers through the desert, exhausting. God opened the Red Sea and they walked through it not a single one died. After they got through it, they were fed manna and quail because they were exhausted and hungry. They came to the bitter waters of Mara, where God healed the waters and God provided water for 1.5 million escapees called the Israelites. This is what's happened in the last 30 days. That was a pretty full month. Have you all had a last full 30 days like they did? Probably not. But they were exhausted physically and spiritually. Now, the scripture says they camped out in a place called Raphadim. Now, can I just encourage you, when you study your Old Testament, don't overlook the names, the proper names of people and places. They often mean something. The well that they go to is often, often means something or something occurred there. A town is named after certain people or certain things. Raphadim is very significant as well because it means, in Hebrew, a place of rest. Raphadim, a place of rest. So here the Israelites had gone through a very exha exhausting last month and they were in a place called rest. Not thinking much of the, the, of the challenge ahead of them, probably taking it pretty easy, thinking that they were through the worst of it. They had escaped the Egyptians. The Egyptians had now drowned in the Red Sea. So they probably, they were thinking they did not have any enemies. God was feeding them. God was giving them water. So what could go wrong, right? And so they loosen their ties and they take off their boots and they are just enjoying a place of rest. Have you noticed that some of the hardest battles when we, uh, happen when we begin to rest and take it easy spiritually? When we take a break from getting up early to study the word, they happen. When we decide that 10 a.m. is way too early on Sunday morning to get ready to go to church, so we skip it one more time. We don't want to take an evening away, so we decide not to be a part of that small group. We decide that giving God our best is too hard, so we pay all of our bills and just see if there's anything left, and then we don't tithe, we just tip God. So we begin to round the edges of our spiritual commitment and we dip our toes in the gray areas of life more and more and all of a sudden in our time of rest, a battle slaps us across the cheeks. The enemy knows that the best time to attack is at rest, right? Well, here's another lesson. It's often those closest to us that cause the harshest problem. Is there an amen in the house? The, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Raphadim, verse 8. Well, who are these people? 
Who are the Amalekites? It's pretty important to understand who these people are. Well, they're descendants of Esau. We find this in Genesis chapter 36. Remember, uh, last week we talked about Abraham and Isaac, right? So Isaac had two boys. Their names were Esau and Jacob. And it was through the second son, Jacob, that the covenant of Abraham was honored. So it was through that son, uh, Jacob, not Esau. Esau tended to be the troublemaker, the partier, the, the warrior, the one was, uh, that always was getting into trouble. But God decided to use Jacob to express his covenant through. So Esau, he bore a grudge against brother Jacob. We find it in Genesis chapter 27. And it was an ongoing grudge. It was unfinished. So even this day, generations later, Esau's uh, generations, his children's children, all of them were still against the, the brother Jacob and his family. So now they were, the Amalekites, they were the very first enemy to confront Israel after their escape from Egypt. And throughout the Bible... The, uh, the Amalekites, their one aim was to destroy the Israelites. They had been attacking the stragglers, the, those on the edge, the faint, and the weary. They were just constantly focused on destroy Israel, destroy Israel. They were like wolves following a herd of, uh, of deer and constantly attacking the weak. So in the Old Testament... Throughout all of the Old Testament, whenever uh, God spoke of the Amalekites or the prophets did, they were a type. They, they represented the world. They represented the flesh or even sometimes evil or the devil. So, so this is significant. The Amalekites were cousins of the Israelites. Let that sink in. They were kinfolk. They were relatives. The Amalekites were children of Uncle Esau. The Israelites were children of Uncle Jacob. So they should have been, these two groups, the Amalekites and the Israelites, they should have been getting together over fried chicken and potato salad at a family reunion at Disney World with cheesy t-shirts that says, we are at a family reunion. Anybody ever worn those t-shirts? Don't raise your hand. But that's what should have been happening here. They were cousins. They should have been passing on greetings and hugging each other's necks and, and, and playing corn, cornhole and, and softball, just having a great time. They were cousins for Pete's sake. Have you noticed, don't raise your hand here, don't raise your hand. Have you noticed the harshest attacks come from those closest to you. I'm guessing that names and faces are coming in your mind right now, stories that keep you up at night. It's often the ones that you should love the most and they should love you the most that cause the greatest pain in your life. Moses knew the pain too. And God is about to show Moses something that he will never forget. He, he will never forget on how to treat family members. Here's another lesson. Prayer is the most important response to a battle. Prayer is the most important response to a battle. Moses says to Joshua, choose some of our men and go to fight the Malachites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Moses never was without his staff. It was a pretty important tool for not just Moses, any man, any woman in that day. Uh, his posture of standing with a rod, uh, of, uh, standing with a rod represented his prayer. 
throughout the scripture we are reminded what the rod was all about. He is basically saying, Joshua, as you go to battle, I'm going to battle in prayer. His act of holding the staff was what they knew about prayer. I'm so thankful that whenever I hear people say, Pastor, I'm praying for you. Pastor, I'm lifting you to the Father. Pastor, I, I, whenever you're preaching, I want you to know I am lifting you to God. That, that's them holding their staff high. That's them praying for me. That's what Moses was, was saying to his friend Joshua. Now notice something else significant here. The winner and loser were, the winners and losers weren't determined by their own skill or power in this battle. Rather, the key to winning was the battle as it related to prayer and nothing else. It had nothing to do with Joshua's wisdom or the sharpness of his swords or how many men he had or what place on the hill or the valley he had. They succeeded because Moses and his friends were praying. Here's something else. God will often use whatever is currently in your hand. God will use whatever is currently in your hands. Where, where do we see Moses' rod through the scripture? Well, when Moses stood in front of the burning bush, God told him, to pick up a snake. And when he did, it turned in to a staff. It was the staff that he was holding. He held, he held his staff as a symbol of God's authority. Whenever he spoke to Egypt and the Egyptian leaders, he held his staff high and it represented his authority. During the plagues of gnats and frogs and bloody water, they all responded to Moses' command whenever he was holding his staff. It was while he was holding his staff that the Red Sea divided. It was while he was holding his staff and he touched it to the waters of Mara that the bitter water became pure and 1.5 million people had pure water to drink. So it was not just a crooked stick. It wasn't just a shepherd's staff. It had spiritual significance for Moses. It represented something. So what did Moses' staff represent? Like, let me tell you, it represented a recognition of God's authority in his battle. It was God's battle, and he represented God in that battle. It represented a remembrance of how God used that staff many times before. I, I can just imagine that during the battle that we read today, as things didn't, perhaps didn't go as he thought, my guess is he looked at that, that, that staff and it reminded him of all of the ways God had led him. Miracle after miracle got him, got him out of mess after mess. It reminded him of what God had done in the past. And it was also a recognition that they could not succeed without God. They could not succeed without God. It was not just, it, it was just a stick that God had anointed in the hands of a faithful follower. So God would often use whatever was in the hands of those in the Old Testament and New Testament. Sometimes it was just a little stone in the hands of a little boy that we now call King David. Sometimes it was just the gift of carpentry in the hands of a, of a skilled young man by the name of Noah. Sometimes it was, it's just a $20 bill in the hands of a willing servant. Sometimes it's a genuine hug that God uses for us to love one of our friends. I don't understand, don't underestimate the ability of God 
using something that is minor that we hadn't even imagined that God could use for his honor. Something interesting happens in the story at this point. Joshua goes to the valley to fight. Moses goes onto the hillside where leaders were to go, and he is to pray. That was his responsibility. And he prays by lifting his staff that represents God in the air. The scripture says, as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. So when Moses was praying and recognizing God's authority and power over the battle, they always won. But when Moses stopped praying, when his hands grew tired and began to fall, that is when the battle would turn against them. Here's our lesson. Friends and family are necessary for your spiritual success. God's leaders have always depended on others to support them in that work. David had his Jonathan. Paul had his Timothy. Jesus had his disciples. Moses had his Aaron and her. And at the time of this battle, we find that Moses is about 80 years old. And as the battle grew, it began to exhaust him because he was constantly holding his staff up high, praying for his soldiers below. And when the staff dropped, he began to realize that the battle would turn. So his friends, Aaron and Hur, realized what their responsibility was. And they got a large boulder and they rolled it up and they sat him down on the boulder and they stood on either side and they held the staff up, ensuring that, that Moses' arms was constantly assisted so that he could pray and success would be theirs. Let me ask you. Who is your Aaron and her? Who is ensuring your success? Who is making sure that your eye is on the ball, constantly praying, asking you the hard questions, making sure that you have what you need to be successful, praying for you, making sure that you are honoring God in the way that you're administering. Can I tell you that my Aaron and her, one of them is here today, and it's my wife, Darla. There is no way possible for me to succeed spiritually and do the ministry that I do if it weren't for my wife, Darla. Thank you, honey, for the years that you have loved me and prayed for me. There's no way that I could do what I'm doing if it weren't for Darla and her mom, uh, Roseanne. She isn't able to be here today. She's got a bit of an allergy cough, and she didn't want you all to think that she had XYZ disease. Uh, so pray for her. But uh, mom and Darla have been very significant in my life. Let me ask you this. I've asked you, who are your, your Aaron and her? But who is your Moses? Who are you praying for? Who have you said, I'm committed to making sure that you're successful? Who are you lifting their arms, praying for them constantly, making sure that they succeed? Are you praying for your future pastor? If not, I encourage you right now, begin to pray every single day because when he or she arrives, 
They're going to feel the responsibility very heavy on their shoulders. Begin praying for them every day, ensuring that they succeed. I've always felt that there are some things that we can't do or battles that we cannot win unless we have somebody significant standing beside us holding up our arms, somebody in our church, somebody in our family, somebody ensuring that they are praying whenever we're exhausted. There are some places that we can't go. There, is, there are uh, spiritual battles that we will not be able to win unless we are standing beside somebody praying for them. So it says Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Now, we are tempted to end the story right there. It's a great story about God's power. It's a great lesson on prayer and the importance of people in our, in our lives. We can just say amen and we can give the benediction and we can go and we can have our meal down at XYZ restaurant, right? Good story, right? But the primary lesson in this story, we haven't even got there yet. Remember, God has been introducing himself more and more to the Israelites with new names. So we're about to get there. So it, it, the, the sixth lesson is, it is important to testify of God's victories in your life. The scripture says in verse, verse 14, when the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it. Because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Now, the King James Version translates this as rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. The literal translation of this Hebrew word is set it in the ears of Joshua. Set it in the ears. Have you heard the... the uh, the put down that little kids say, well, stick it in your ear, right? Have you, uh, I never have been a really good cusser. In fact, I've never even been a bad cusser. I don't even know how to spell some cuss words, okay? So, but I can tell you as a little boy, about as harsh as I would, would be to my, my twin brother, I would say, well, stick it in your ear, right? Have you ever, anybody ever heard that? Stick it in your, that's really what the Hebrew word is here. It means to put it in the ear of Joshua that he may know what I have done through prayer. Basically, literally, make sure he knows I did this because when the Amalekites are no more, and in, uh, what, which was an impossible notion at that time, I want Joshua to know it was me who did it. So stick it in his ear. Who knew Hebrew could be so fun? Woo! <laughs> so why is it so important for us to remember to write, to journal, to testify. It reminds us that if God acted in the past, he will act in the future. Did you hear that? It reminds us that if he acted that way in the past, why couldn't we stand on that truth? Because he's going to do the very same thing in the future. Right, Tom? God's not going to do something strange back here and then in the future go, oh, that's not who I am. No, God does not change. Who he was in the Old Testament is who he is in the New Testament, is who he is in our lives today. Stick it in his ear so he remembers that. You're going to hear that from your kids today, I'm sure. <laughs> Let them go. They're, they're speaking Hebrew. <laughs> it also reminds us that God's promise will come true. God, in a somber I will declaration, predicts Am Amalek uh, Amalek's final, complete, utter demise. How do you think that helped Moses and Joshua in future battles? God promised it. 
He's going to bring it to pass. Write it down. Stick it in your ears and don't ever forget that. I promise, God says. And it builds others up. And he prepares them for the next battle. Now let's get to the new name, okay? You thought I forgot. I didn't, I promise. Number seven, God will purposely show himself to us and the direction we should go. Verse 15, Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner, he said, for hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. So here's the name, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. Often, we think that a banner is a large piece of cloth, maybe a flag. There's a, a banner, you know, we often see that type of banner. Sometimes it's a banner that's hanging down from, from the ceiling, and sometimes we have uh, holiday scenes on banners in, in sanctuaries. But in the Old Testament, a banner was often a metal pole. Sometimes it had a big eagle on the top if you're a Roman soldier, and sometimes it had some other type of emblem, but it, it tended to be something flashy, something bright, something tall, right? In fact, the word banner could be translated, or nisi could be translated to sparkle. Nisi meant to sparkle. It was to catch the eye of both the soldier and to spark fear in the hearts of the enemy, the Nisi. So when Moses names the altar Jehovah Nisi, he was saying the Lord is my banner, and I declare this as a memorial. I rally behind Jehovah. It is to Jehovah Nisi that we rally behind. It's to him that I look for my strength. It is him whom I will follow, Jehovah Nisi. Can I tell you what the purpose of a banner is? in the Old Testament especially, following into the New Testament. It always was in a place that people could see it. The one who carried the banner, the Nisi, was always at the top of the hill or standing behind the general. Wherever the one making the decision was, the banner, the Nisi, was always right there. Those of you who, are, who have been in the military, you understand this culture, this context, the colors, the, the flashiness, where authority uh, should be, where the eyes of the soldiers should be. Sparkle, or Nisi, was to make sure that everybody could see where to look. They looked for where it was flashing. They looked for the gold. They looked for the eagle. They looked for the red, the, the colors up on top of the hill because it was the Nisi that everybody would look to to find out if they were to go this way or that way or this way. It was the Nisi that they were to look for their authority. It represented certain characteristics of the battalion or the leader. If you have been uh, in the military, you know the importance of colors. Both of our boys, Jordan and Andrew, they're, they're both in the military, and it, it warms our hearts whenever they begin talking about their colors, about the different colors of the beret, of certain badges, certain stripes, certain leaders who have certain colors on their chest, and there's a great amount of, 
of pride in their hearts when they talk about that, when they take their hats off, when they see certain colors waving in the sky. It means something. It, it represents history. It represents certain levels of authority and respect. It produces great pride in them and resolve. But it also gave clear direction to the soldiers. When to attack. Which direction to go. Who should do what. In what turn. If they should chase. If they should come back. If they should retreat. It was the banner. It was the Nisi held high, flashing in the sky that would tell them exactly what they should do. And it was a rally point for the soldiers. Everyone knew that where the Nisi was, safety would be right there. When they were in trouble, they knew that they could run to the banner and they would find direction and peace and protection. And so by introducing himself as Jehovah Nisi, God was telling his people, I will not hide from you, my friends. I will sparkle and I will glisten. I, I will be where you can always see me and I will make my direction clear if you just look for me. Look to me for your courage because I am your Nisi. Trust my directives. Even when smoke is down in the valley and death is in the valley, look to the hill because I will stand and you will see my sparkle, my Nisi, and in it represents my authority. It represents history. It represents um, uh, what I've done in the past. It represents that I will direct your path. Look to me. Trust my directives. And I will always make myself clear to you. I am Jehovah. Nisi. The Lord is my banner. Would you please stand? I know this will come as a shock to you, but when I was young and in school and even out of school, I was a drummer. Drummers rule. <laughs> Woodwind players drool. Sorry, bad joke. <laughs> but I was a drummer. And to be honest, I, I'm still a drummer. I there's a beat in my chest. I just, I can't get out of it. I, it comes natural to me. In fact, when Darla and I hold hands driving down the road listening to good country music, I drive her crazy because I'm drumming on all my fingers. Did you know why you have 10 fingers? It's because there is a different beat and a different drum for each finger, right? I mean, that's what fingers were for, is to, is to draw, is to tap and to beat and, and to hit cymbals, right? That's who I was. So whenever I was young and in choir, high school, my choir teacher recognized it and, and he made me the assistant director of our choir. So whenever he had to be gone, he would hand me his baton, David Rice. And he asked me if, if I would lead the choir. And I took it serious. And I knew the beat. And as I held this plastic piece of authority, I knew that my choir would watch. And they knew when that they should come in. And they knew the rhythm of the song. And when it was time to stop. And I would catch their attention. They would look for the Nisi to make sure that they knew where to go, where to stop, how to start, what was the song all about. It was when they watched my baton that they knew exactly what to do next. I was in marching band 
And my older brother, Kevin, he was four years older. He was the drum major. And it was his responsibility to lead us. <laughs> he looked strange. He might be watching today, but he had a big feather hat, or a big leather black hat. And then he had one of these gold plume feathers. I mean, it was like 18 inches tall. White, silk, fluffy, blousey shirt and black pants. And he had these black leather riding boots that came almost to his knees. But can I tell you, it was all so that everybody could distinguish him from all of us in our marching uniforms. And he took it serious. And he would hold his niece high. And as we watched over the dozens and dozens of lines in front of us, we could see my brother, the drum major, telling us exactly where the beat was. And we had knew exactly how fast or how slow. And then he would begin to give motions with his niece. We could not hear him except sometimes the whistle that we would hear. And he would tell us exactly which direction we were to go how fast we were to march, if we were to march in place, or if we were to double time it down the street. We couldn't do it unless my brother, the drum major, lifted his niece high and it told us exactly where we were to go. God gave us a lasting niece as well. It once stood on the hillside so that all could see. It sparkled in the sun. That sparkle came from the blood that had been spilled. You see, Jesus, the Son of God, had given his own life and allowed himself to be crucified, dying for our sins. And today that banner, this cross, represents that God will go to the absolute limits to show his love for us. And when we are in the middle of our banner, a battle, may we look to the cross to remind us that God loves us with an unconditional love. And that will be that, and that will do absolutely everything. He will do everything to bring us back into fellowship with Him. So God says, My name for you is Jehovah Nisi. I am your banner. My intent is to sparkle on a hill high to catch your attention. And if you will trust me in your battle, I will give you direction. I will provide you with courage, with comfort, and with peace. Look to me, God says. And I will stand glistening in the darkness. And I want to provide everything that you need for victory. My name, God says, I am Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. Would you sing this song with Darla?
benediction. David wrote in the Psalms, but you have raised a banner for those who fear you, a rallying point in the face of attack. May you recognize this week that Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner, sparkles on the hillside, desiring to give you comfort and direction and victory. So now, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace, for he has already gone before you. You're dismissed.